now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries on the Cosmic Wars. Today, I'm going to talk about graphene golems. I'll explain to you what a golem is, and then I'll talk about the graphene angle. This has to do with uh, regenerative medicine. It has to do with graphene, stem cell research, and I will elaborate. Uh, First of all, what is a golem? A golem, spelled G-O-L-E-M, and I'm reading this from Wikipedia, Spookipedia. A golem, G-O-L-E-M, is an animated anthropomorphic being in Jewish folklore, which is entirely created from inanimate matter, usually clay or mud. In the Psalms and medieval writings, the word golem was used as a term for an amorphous, unformed material. And the uh, golem could be tasked by its creator uh, to do any number of things, to be a warrior, to be a uh, slayer, to do various and sundry tasks. Further down in the article, let me continue to read. The oldest stories of golems date to early Judaism. In the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin 38b, 38b is in Bravo, Adam was initially created as a golem when his dust was, quote, kneaded into a shapeless husk, unquote. Like Adam, all golems are created from mud by those close to, by those close to divinity, divinity, but no anthropogenic golem is fully human. Early on, the main disability of the golem was his inability to speak. Sanhedrin 65 Bravo describes Rava creating a man he sent the man to Rav Zira. Rav Zira spoke to him, but he did not did not answer. Uh, let me go further down. The classic narrative, the Golem of Prague. The most famous Golem narrative involves Judah Lo Ben Bezalel, uh, the late 16th century rabbi of Prague, also known as the Maharal, who reportedly created a Golem out of clay from the banks of the of the Vatara River and brought it through life through rituals and Hebrew incantations to defend the Prague ghetto from anti-Semitic attacks and pogroms. This uh, rabbi, Judah Lo Ben Bezalel, was a Kabbalist. He was a Kabbalistic mag- magician, okay? And everyone, a lot of people talk about Crowley and his Thelemic magic and merging... Uh, the best of ancient Comedian, i.e. ancient Egyptian uh, magic, uh, the Hindu Kalas, uh, the Golden Dawn, OTO, etc., etc., merging them and out of that creating his own Thelemic magic, right? Well, the underpinning, the basis of Crowley's magic was always the Kabbalah, okay? So just want to get that out there. So this Kabbalist, this rabbi, creates this golem to defend the Prague ghetto from anti-Semitic attacks and programs. Uh, the golem was called Yosef and was known as Yozella. It was said that he could make himself invisible and summon spirits from the dead. Very interesting. Rabbi Lowe, L-O-E-W, probably mispronouncing that, deactivated the golem on Friday evenings by removing the Shem before the Sabbath. Now, apparently, at least according to the stories handed down to the profane people like us how this golem was animated was the word shem was written on a piece of paper or inscribed on something some material and placed either in the mouth of the golem or on its forehead and then it would animate it okay so there was some kind of incantation something to do with uh, wordplay gematria all that stuff that factored into this Okay, getting back to the story. Uh, the golem was called Yosef and was known as Yo- Yozella. It was said that he could make himself invisible and summon spirits from the dead. Rabbi Lo deactivated the golem on Friday evenings by removing the Shem before the Sabbath, Saturday, began, so as to let it rest on Sabbath. One Friday evening, Rabbi Lo f- 
forgot to remove the Shem, oopsies, right? And feared that the golem would desecrate the Sabbath. A different story tells of a golem that fell in love and when reject, rejected became the violent monster seen in most accounts. Some versions have the golem eventually going on a murderous rampage. The rabbi then managed to pull the Shem from his mouth and immobilize him in front of the synagogue, whereupon the golem fell in pieces. The golem's body was stored in the attic geniza of the old new synagogue, where it would be restored to life again if needed. Rabbi Lo then forbade anyone except his successors from going into the attic. Rabbi Yeshezkel Landau, a successor of Rabbi Lo, reportedly wanted to go up the steps to the attic when he was chief rabbi of Prague to verify the tradition. Rabbi Landau fast, fasted and immersed himself in a mikvah, wrapped himself in a phylacteries and prayer shawl, and started ascending the steps. At the top of the steps, he hesitated and then came immediately back down, trembling and frightened. He then reenacted Rabbi Lowe's original warning. According to legend, the body of Rabbi Lowe's golem still lies in the synagogue's attic. Uh, when the attic was renovated in 1883, no evidence of the golem was found. Uh, well, that's not necessarily a good thing uh, that, that the body isn't there, but golem, okay? Golem. And I first heard the concept of the golem, uh, funnily enough, when I was reading a comic book. I don't know if I mentioned this. I think I did, but I used to have gobs of comic books. And not just Marvel and DC, but various uh, companies. Uh, Gold Key, Gold Circle, etc., etc. And I had a lot of comics in what I called the, uh, the scary comic genre. Uh, Marvel, DC, and all the other brands, they had their own versions of, of scary stories usually two or three stories in one comic book, regular size comic book. And in one of the stories in these scary comics, I think it was a DC comic book, it was about, it was a World War II take on the Golem story from 16th century Prague. The World War II take was the Warsaw Uprising and this rabbi in Poland, uh, in Warsaw rather, he decided to reactivate the golem. He did. It wiped out, kicked ass, and all the Germans, uh, the SS, etc., etc. And then after it had kicked all the rashes, wiped them all out, he took the Shem out of its mouth or off off of his forehead. That's right. Um, the word was inscribed on the golem's forehead, and then it went back to sleep in the attic. Right. So that's the first time I heard the story. Years later, in my research, I came across the concept again. So, what's the relevance? What does it have to do? Well, the graphene golems I'm going to describe, the potential for the graphene golems, I feel, uh, is real. I'm saying it's a distinct possibility. I'm not saying with absolute certainty we're going to have these graphene golems, graphene zombies, call them what you will, but the possibility exists and has to be accounted for. Again, we're talking about intentions and capabilities. What are our foes capable of doing? Okay, so I just wanted to get that bit out there about the golems. Talk at length about that. Now, the next part I want to discuss has to do with the reactivation of dead brains. In this case, dead brains of pigs. This is an article from uh, BigThink.com, and it has to do with uh, Yale scientists restoring cellular function in 32 dead pig brains. And I'll provide the link for this, BigThink.com. Yale scientists restore cellular function in 32 dead pig brains. Researchers hope the technology will further our understanding of the brain but lawmakers may not be ready for the ethical challenges. Researchers at the Yale School of Medicine successfully restored some functions to pig brains that have been dead for hours. They hope the technology will advance our understanding of the brain, 
potentially developing new treatments for debilitating diseases and disorders, yada, yada, yada. They always couch these things in the, we want to help society, we want to help people, we want to cure disease. The research raises many ethical questions and puts to the test our current understanding of death. What is dead may never die, quote, unquote. Uh, this came largely from the Yale School of Medicine. They connected 32 pig brains to a system called Brain X. Brain X is an artificial perfusion system. That is a system that takes over the functions normally regulated by the organ. The pigs have been the pigs have been killed four hours earlier at a U.S. Department of Agricultural Agriculture slaughterhouse. Their brains completely removed from the skulls. Brain X pumped an experiment so should read experimental solution into the brain that essentially mimicked blood flow. It brought oxygen and nutrients to the tissues, giving brain cells the resources to begin many normal functions. The cells began consuming and metabolizing sugars. The brain's immune systems kicked in. Neuron samples could carry an electrical signal. Some brain cells even responded to drugs. The researchers have managed to keep some brains alive for up to 36 hours and currently do not know if brain X can have sustained the brains longer. Quote, it is conceivable we are just preventing the inevitable and the brain won't be able to recover, unquote, said Nanad Sestan, Yale neuroscientist and the lead researcher. The researchers hope the technology can enhance our ability to study the brain and its cellular functions. One of the main avenues of such studies would be brain disorders and diseases. This could point the way to developing new, new treatments for the likes of brain injuries, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and neurodegenerative conditions. So I wanted to run that by you, the notion, which we've already seen at a surface level, where the brains of pigs are being, uh, in some fashion, reanimated not to full functioning level and it's not hooked up to anything these are just the brains but they're showing theoretically it's possible to reanimate brains okay so keep that point in mind the reason i wanted to talk about this subject is because i've known of the possibility of zombies being created for some time not only because I've had many, many zombie type experiences in my lab, my lab experiences and in my dreams, right? Whether it was an alternate reality, a possible future timeline scenario, training, whatever the case may be, I had many, many of these zombie dreams. And in one of them, one of the most important dreams that I can recall, and I talked about this before, but I happened to be able to see with my etheric third eye vision the progression of this contagion within people. And I could just tell they had kind of a greenish, bluish cast to them, and it was certain parts of the body that was uh, affected. And I can see, based on their coloration, how much coloration, this greenish blue tint they had, how much longer they had before they turned, right? So I'd look at somebody, oh, that person's got three days, oh, that person's ready to go. Uh, one time in that dream, I walked by a mother and a daughter. Uh, the mother looked like she was ready to go at any time. The, the, the girl, little girl, about six, seven years old, probably going to go in two to three days, right? So, and this was long before all this stuff started happening within the last two years. So that was food for thought, that perhaps some contagion, quote-unquote, or perhaps the treatments for said contagions or said outbreaks or said illnesses can somehow induce this effect whereby these people turn into the undead, the living dead zombies, right? So, 
I was already exposed to this concept for some time about zombies and the possibility that at some point we may be confronted with a real-life zombie apocalypse. Now, what prompted me to do this particular commentary, and I, I've done commentaries in the past about zombies, but what gave added urgency to me doing another commentary about zombies was I saw this video of these three guys, two or three guys in a cemetery in Israel. And some of you have probably seen this. A colleague of mine sent it to me, uh, I think. Anyway, these guys were in the cemetery in Israel. One of them was, it was an English guy. And they had the Bluetooth app on their phones. And so they fired up that Bluetooth app and immediately it began picking up the signals, uh, the Mac, Apple, Bluetooth signals, right? Whatever application what they were using, the, uh, the cadavers, the corpses were still emitting these, um, these signals, which were detectable by the Bluetooth. And they kept counting as, as more and more of these um, serial number designators were showing up on their uh, Bluetooth apps, right? And they counted up to 30, 30 some odd, 30, 31, 32, something around there, uh, signals from that cemetery. In other words, there were approximately 31 or 32 bodies in that cemetery that were uh, given these treatments, let's say, and they wound up succumbing, dying, and the nanotech, etc., inside them was still sending out signals, right? And I got to wondering about that. I thought, well, well, why? Why do they still send signals out, right? Why would they need to have them in there even after they've expired? Well, when the undertaker uh, at the morgue or at the funeral parlor, when they're working with the, with the deceased, they, they drain it of blood, right? So there's no blood inside the, uh, the corpses. I don't know if they, they replace it with some other fluid. Uh, I think, yes, they do, embalming fluid, I think, is what they do. Point being is that there's no blood in these people. So the whatever is emitting those signals is not coursing around through the blood of the of the deceased. The, those signals must be emanating from other parts of the body uh, where the major organs are. Who knows where? All right. And I thought, well. Either they have such fantastic resources, which they do, that they don't mind that all that nanotechnology, all those nano operating systems, all the graphene, etc., have essentially gone to waste, and they're, ju they're just going to write off all that technology emitting those Bluetooth signals, write them off as wastage or overage, right? Those of you that have worked in factories, uh, you know what I mean by overage. And I guess they're rich enough that they may not care. Uh, so what? You know, it served its purpose while they were alive. And, you know, we can just write it off as wastage, right? They're probably being taxpayer subsidized anyway, the way they work things out. Or something else is going on. Because those cadavers are still emitting the signals. And those cadavers, all without exception, the, the La Quinta team in Spain, they, they confirmed that it d doesn't matter what type of stabination you receive, so-called stabinations, they're all gonna have graphene. Whether they've got the mRNA gene therapy or you know just the other types, one thing they do have in common, they all have graphene. So I'm wondering, 
well, what's the rate of decomposition of these bodies uh, from the very oldest bodies that succumbed to the disease and or the treatments, right? Uh, what's the rate of decay, decomposition from the oldest to the most recent? Why are they still sending out these signals? And so I just started digging in and doing a bit of research, okay? So I've talked about golems. I've talked about the Bluetooth signals emanating from the the corpses in the cemeteries, and, and they reckoned that, well, the Bluetooth showed there was like 30 people in that cemetery, 30 corpses that were emitting these signals. Okay, so I did start doing a bit more research, okay? Okay, here are articles about sound waves. Sound waves, and we've discussed this before. It's well known in the field that sound waves, and particularly ultra-high sound waves, can be used as a delivery system, right? There's an article from RMIT, Romeo Michael India Tango, rmit.edu.au. Uh, sound waves power new advances in drug delivery and smart materials. And, of course, I'd like you to look at this from within the context of the 5G rollout, okay? Researchers have revealed how high-frequency sound waves can be used to build new materials, make smart nanoparticles, and even deliver drugs to the lungs for painless, needle-free vaccinations. So how nice of them. While sound waves have been part of science and medicine for decades, ultrasound was first used for clinical imaging in 1942 and for driving chemical reactions in the 1980s, the technologies have always relied on low frequencies. Now researchers at RMIT University have shown how high-frequency sound waves could revolutionize the field of ultrasound-driven chemistry. A new review published in Advanced Science reveals the bizarre effects of these sound waves on materials and cells such as molecules that seem to spontaneously order themselves after being hit with a sonic equivalent of a semi-trailer. The researchers also detail various exciting applications of their pioneering work, including drug delivery to the lungs, patented nebulization technology that could deliver life-saving drugs and vaccines by inhalation rather than through injections, drug-protecting nanoparticles, drug protecting nanoparticles, encapsulating drugs and special nanocoatings to protect them from deterioration, control their release over time, and ensure they precisely target the right places in the body like tumors or infections. Breakthrough smart materials, sustainable production of super porous nanomaterials that can be used to store, separate, release, protect almost anything, and nano manufacturing 2D materials. Precise, cost-effective, and fast exfoliation of atomically thin quantum dots and nanosheets. A lead researcher, distinguished professor Leslie Yao and his team have spent over a decade researching the interaction of sound waves at frequencies above 10 megahertz with different materials. But Yao says they are only now starting to understand the range of strange phenomena they often observe in the lab. Quote, when we couple high-frequency sound waves into fluids, materials, and cells, the effects are extraordinary, he says. We've harnessed the power of these sound waves to develop innovative bio biomedical technologies and to synthesize advanced materials. But our discoveries have also changed our fundamental understanding of ultrasound-driven chemistry and revealed how little we really know. That's because you guys are surface level and you have no idea that this kind of stuff's been done for decades in the uh, advanced R&D centers. Anyway, further down in the article, Sonic Waves, How to Power Chemistry with Sound. The RMIT research team, which includes Dr. Amgad Ress, Dr. Heba Ahmed, and Dr. Swadi Ramasan, generates high-frequency sound waves on a microchip to precisely manipulate fluids or materials. Ultrasound has long been used at low frequencies, around 10 hertz to 3 megahertz, to drive chemical reactions, a field known as sonochemistry. 
At these low frequencies, sinochemical reactions are driven by the violent implosion of air bubbles. This process, known as cavitation, results in huge pressures and ultra-high temperatures like a tiny and extremely localized pressure cooker. But it turns out that if you up the frequency, these reactions change completely. When high-frequency sound waves were transmitted into various materials and cells, the researchers saw behavior that had never been observed with low-frequency ultrasound. Quote, We've seen self-ordering molecules that seem to orient themselves in the crystal along the direction of the sound waves, unquote, Yao says. Quote, the sound wavelengths involved can be over 100,000 times larger than an individual molecule, so it's incredibly puzzling how something, something so tiny can be precisely manipulated with something so big. Uh, gee, I, I wonder. It's like driving a truck through a random scattering of Lego bricks, then finding those pieces stacked nicely on top of each other. It shouldn't happen. Biomedical advances. While low-frequency cavitation can often destroy molecules and cells, they remain mostly intact under the high-frequency sound waves. That's a key point. While low-frequency cavitation can often destroy molecules and cells, they remain mostly intact under the high-frequency sound waves. This makes them gentle enough to use in biomedical devices to manipulate biomolecules and cells without affecting their integrity. The basis for the various drug delivery technologies patented by the RMIT research team. One of these patented devices is a cheap, lightweight, and portable advanced nebulizer that can precisely deliver large molecules such as DNA and antibodies unlike existing nebulizers. So further down the article talking about smart materials. The team has used the sound waves to drive crystallization for the Sustainable Production of Metal Organic Frameworks, or MOFs, Metal Organic Frameworks, predicted to be the defining material of the 21st century, of the 21st century, MOFs are ideal for sensing and trapping substances at minute concentrations to purify water or air and can also hold large amounts of energy for making better batteries and energy storage devices. While the conventional process for making a MOF can take hours or days, and requires the use of harsh solvents or intensive energy processes, the RMI team, RMIT team has developed a clean sound wave driven technique that can produce a customized metallic organic framework in minutes and can be easily scaled up for mass for efficient mass production. Sound waves can also be used for man, nano manufacturing 2D materials which are used in myriad applications from flexible electric circuits to solar cells. And they're talking about scaling all this up, okay? So, point of relevance is, we know that certain sound wave frequencies can deliver medicine, uh, DNA, even imbue people with disease, okay, if... if if they want to do that, certain harmful frequencies, we know that. But the point of relevance here is these ultra high frequencies, sonic frequencies, can send chemicals, uh, enzymes, uh, or synthesized enzymes, or some kind of catalytic, catalytic uh, response, engender some kind of catalytic response within things, okay? Within people, it, it, they can use this to transmit chemicals, medicine, instructions, something, okay? Anything. So keep that point in mind because I'm trying to build a mosaic, a pattern here, right? Cadavers, graphene, all these non-operating systems that are still in, in those cadavers, in, the, in those corpses crank up these ultra high frequencies okay start sending messages commands information things to create chemical responses to catalyze uh, responses potentially within corpses okay that's where I'm leading to talked about the golems talked about the Bluetooth pinging on all these Number designators indicating an individual corpse in a cemetery. Now I just talked about 
ultra high frequencies being used to send everything from DNA. And let's use our imagination, not just DNA of, of humans. Or We know that in these treatments, so-called, they put the DNA of all kinds of life forms and their insects and monkeys and pigs and, and all that stuff. All, all, also talked about the pig brains being reanimated, uh, at least for the time being. Okay, Now I just talked about the ultra ultrasonic frequencies used to send, transmit things into people for medical purposes people and potentially corpses in our example okay next part this next part deals with regenerative medicine regenerative medicine and the role graphene plays in regenerative medicine let me read you some articles this is where it gets really interesting and i'll explain some technical terms like scaffolding as well this has to do with not just tissue regeneration, but the regeneration of different organs, different parts of the body, uh, of sinew, of muscle mass, of uh, cartilage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's regeneration. It's it's a whole bioscience field is regeneration. And let me just dig up some articles that I think are very interesting. Here's one uh, from ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. Graphene-based nanocomposites for neural tissue engineering. Graphene has made significant contributions to neural tissue engineering due to its electrical conductivity, key point, the body electric, right? Due to its electrical conductivity, biocompatibility, mechanical strength, and high surface area. And here's from another article. This is called When Stem Cells Meet Graphene, Opportunities and Challenges in Regenerative Medicine. Now, let me talk about stem cells really quick. What are they and what do they do? Stem cells are the body's raw materials, cells from which all other cells with specialized functions are generated. Under the right conditions in the body or a laboratory, stem cells divide to form more cells called daughter cells. And I'm getting this from the Mayo Clinic website, www.mayoclinic.org, uh, about stem cells. These daughter cells become either new stem cells or specialized cells, differentiation with a more specific function such as blood cells, brain cells, heart muscle cells, or bone cells, okay? So what they're saying here is stem cells, if you know how to use them and manipulate them, you can cause them to create, differentiate, and create cells for different specific functions, such as blood cells, brain cells, heart muscle cells, or bone cells. No other cell in the body has the natural ability to generate new cell types. Okay? So keep that point in mind. Here's the graphene connection. This is from sciencedirect.com, February 2018. When stem cells meet graphene, opportunities and challenges in regenerative medicine. And the whole idea of regenerative medicine is to create damaged or uh, repair damaged tissue of various kinds or create new tissue, okay? When stem cells meet graphene, opportunities and challenges in regenerative medicine. Abstract, recent advances in stem cell research and nanotechnology have significantly influenced the landscape of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Precise and reproducible control of the fate of stem cells and their lineage specification have therefore become more crucial than ever for the success of stem cell-based technologies. Extensive research has been geared towards developing materials that are capable of mimicking the physiological microenvironment of stem cells and at the same time controlling their eventual fate. An interesting example of this, these materials is a two-dimensional graphene and its related derivatives. A high specific surface area coupled with superior chemical stability 
biocompatibility and flexibility and functionalization render graphene-based nanomaterials one of the most exciting platforms for tissue engineering and regenerative, regenerative medicine applications, especially for stem cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation. Okay, here's another article, this one from frontiersin.org. Interfacing graphene-based materials with neural cells. The scientific community has witnessed an exponential increase in the applications of graphene and graphene-based materials in a wide range of fields from engineering to electronics to biotechnologies and biomedical applications. For what concerns neuroscience, the interest raised by these materials is twofold. On one side, nanosheets made of graphene or graphene derivatives, graphene oxide or its reduced form, can be used as carriers for drug delivery. And we're already talking about that, about drug delivery being in the form, in, in our example, of ultra-high ultra frequencies. Here, an important aspect is to evaluate their toxicity, which strongly depends on flake composition, chemical functionalization, and dimensions. On the other side, graphene can be exploited as a substrate for tissue engineering. In this case, conductivity is probably the most relevant there it is again, electrical conductivity, the body electric, somehow revivifying, reanimating through engendering or kickstarting, once again, elect bioelectric processes within people or potentially within corpses, let's see, or people that may, the possibility also of, of people who, well, they started out pretty much human until they got the patented pan treatments, and then in the process, one when the 5G is cranking up, I'm getting ahead of myself, but they start to turn. They don't wait for them to die in, 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 in this example because I'm, I'm using graphene golems in, in its widest sense, not just those that are already buried in cemeteries sending out all these pulse signals, right? All this Bluetooth um, uh, symbols, signals that may be picked up, but people that are still technically alive that may be turned, okay, because we're... we're that's what I'll get into that more of that later. Uh, let's see. In this case, conductivity is probably the most relevant amongst the various properties of the different graphene materials as it may allow to instruct and interrogate neural networks as well as to drive neural growth and differentiation. Okay, remember, I talked about pig brains being reanimated at least for a little while. Now we're talking here of graphene along with stem cell research and probably other things being used to regrow neural tissue, but not just regrow neural tissue. It has to do with the, the synapses, the, 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 uh, the connections in the brain, uh, which parts of the brain are emphasized in, in our example, uh, right? In this case, conductivity is probably the most relevant amongst the various properties of the different graphene materials, as it may allow to instruct and interrogate neural networks, as well as to drive neural growth and differentiation, which holds a great potential in regenerative medicine. Graphene is a single or few layered sheet of SP squared bonded carbon atoms tightly packed in a two-dimensional honeycomb lattice with a thickness of only 0.34 nanometers. Each carbon atom has three U bonds and an out-of-plane something bond. I'm going to get all... All that technical stuff goes right over my head. Okay, reading further. Graphene applications in neuroscience. The biomedical applications of G, graphene, represent a field in continuous expansion. Traditional treatments for central nervous system disorders present a number of challenges, thus developing new tools that outperform the state-of-the-art technologies for imaging, drug delivery, neuronal regeneration, and electrical recording and sensing is one of the main goals of modern medicine and neuroscience. Since the development of carbon-related materials, nanotechnology has strongly impacted a number of applications, including drug, gene, and protein delivery to cross the blood-brain barrier and reach compromised brain areas, or potentially emphasize and activate certain parts of the brain, maybe the R complex, I don't know, right? And I'm going to talk about the potential, what could potentially happen. I'm not just talking about reactivating or uh, engendering 
uh, neural growth and neural regeneration, okay? Because there is potentially, and again, we go back to intentions and capabilities, there's potentially a real-time battle information downlink aspect to all this as well, right? Because we know that the graphene and we know the nano-operating systems are transceivers. They're senders and receivers of information. They probably already have pre-programmed algorithms when to differentiate, where to reassemble, what parts of the anatomy to go to, yada, yada, yada. And remember, all these cadavers have already had the blood taken out of them. Uh, the question remains how also this is going to play out with people that are still alive, that are still you know, on this side of the veil, at least from a spiritual sense, uh, including drug, gene, and protein delivery to cross the blood-brain barrier and reach compromised brain areas, neuroregenerative techniques to restore cell-to-cell -cell communication upon damage by interfacing two- or three-dimensional scaffolds with neural cells. Now, at this point, it's important to talk about scaffolding and what it means in this context, okay? Because scaffolding has everything to do with tissue engineering. Here's an article from uh, ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. Scaffolding in tissue engineering, general approaches and tissue-specific considerations. Scaffolds represent important components for tissue engineering. Uh, however, researchers often encounter an enormous variety of choices when selecting scaffolds for tissue engineering. This paper aims to review that the functions of scaffolds and the major, major scaffolding approaches as important guidelines for selecting scaffolds and discuss the time, the tissue-specific considerations for scaffolding using intervertebral disc as an example. Since its emergence in the mid-1980s, tissue engineering has continued to evolve as an exciting and multidisciplinary field aiming to develop biological substitutes to restore, replace, or regenerate defective tissues. Cells, scaffolds, and growth-stimulating signals are generally referred to as the tissue engineering triad, the key components of en engineered tissues. Scaffolds, typically made of polymeric biomaterials, provide the structural support for cell attachment. In other words, the, the basis, the foundation, the template, if you will. Scaffolds, typically made of polymeric biomaterials, provide the structural support for cell attachment and subsequent tissue development. However, researchers often encounter an enormous variety of choices when selecting scaffolds for tissue engineering, etc., uh, etc. Et Apart from blood cells, most, if not all, other normal cells in human tissues are anchorage-dependent residing in a solid matrix called extracellular matrix, or ECM. There are numerous types of ECM in human tissues, which usually have multiple components and tissue-specific composition. Readers are directed to detailed reviews for types, etc., etc. Uh, let me read further down. Firstly, ECM provides structural support and physical environment for cells residing in that tissue to attach, grow, migrate, and respond to signals. Again, the conductivity. But also there's the enzymatic reactions that go on, uh, biochemical, etc. Secondly, ECM gives the tissue its structural and therefore mechanical properties, such as rigidity and elasticity that is associated with the, with the tissue functions. For example, well-organized thick bundles of collagen type 1 in tendon are highly resistant to stretching and are responsible for the high tensile strength of tendons. On the other hand, randomly distributed collagen fibrils and elastin fibers of skin are responsible, are responsible for its toughness and elasticity. Thirdly, ECM may actively provide bioactive cues to the residing cells for regulation of their activities. So here we're talking about the substrate, the template, uh, the the basement level, if you will, the substructure, if you will, upon which tissue regenerative medicine is based, okay? So I just wanted to put that out there uh, just to get that point across of the role that scaffolding plays. And there's a whole article about it and it goes into details. 
which I won't get into. Uh, oh, one more quick point. Pre-made porous scaffolds for cell seeding. Since the birth of tissue engineering, seeding therapeutic cells in pre-made porous scaffolds made of degradable biomaterials has become the most commonly used and well-established scaffolding approach. This approach represents the bulk of biomaterial research in tissue engineering, leading to enormous efforts in development of different types of biomaterials and fabrication technologies. Okay, so let's get back to the graphene and the uh, stem cells, right? Because we, we talked about the stem cells being able to differentiate and create daughter cells, which will either create the actual organ or type of cell needed, or will create even more stem cells, right? And how this all factors into the graphene golems. Once again, back to the frontiersin.org article. Graphene Applications in Neuroscience. Okay, here's the article again. Graphene Applications in Neuroscience. The biomedical applications of graphene represent a field in continuous expansion. Traditional treatments for central nervous system disorders present a number of challenges, thus developing new tools that outperform the state-of-the-art technologies for imaging, drug delivery, neuronal regeneration, and electrical recording and sensing is one of the main goals of modern medicine and neuroscience. Since the development of carbon-related materials, nanotechnology has strongly impacted a number of applications, including drug, gene, and protein, protein delivery to cross the blood-brain barrier and reach compromised areas, brain areas, neuroregenerative techniques to restore cell-cell communication upon damage by interfacing two or three dimensional scaffolds. And I just went into detail about scaffolds being the, the substrate, the, uh, the, the fundamental basis, the platform, if you will. With neural cells, highly specific and reliable diagnostic tools for in vivo sensing of disease biomarkers by cell labeling and real-time monitoring of biological active molecules. Okay, I'm going to read from one more article, and then you'll get my point behind all of this. This is from pubmed.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. Graphene-based materials in neuro tissue in neural tissue regeneration. Abstract, due to its extraordinary features such as large surface area, high electrical conductivity, again, chemical stability, and mechanical properties, graphene attracts great interest in various fields of biomedical sciences, including biosensors, cancer therapy, diagnosis, and regenerative medicine. The use of graphene-based materials has been of great interest for the design of scaffolds, I already talked about that, that can promote neural tissue regeneration, okay? Regenerating the brain, essentially. Recent studies published over the last few years clearly show that graphene and graphene-based materials promote adhesion, proliferation, and differentiation of various cells, including embryonic stem cells, neural stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells. Therefore, graphene-based materials materials are one of the promising nanoplatforms in regenerative medicine for neural tissue injury. With its unique topographic and chemical properties, graphene is used as a scaffold that could provide a bridge between regenerating nerves. With its unique topographic and chemical properties, graphene is used as a scaffold that could pr provide a bridge between regenerating nerves. More importantly, as a conductive substrate, graphene allows the continuation of electrical co conduction between damaged damage nerve ends. The integration of supportive cells such as glial neural precursor or stem cells in such a scaffold shows higher regeneration when compared to currently used neural autographs and nerve conduits. Okay, so again... The brain has been deprived of oxygen. person is dead, has been dead for some time. They have graphene throughout their body. Also the nanoparticles, and also what's interesting is these, these synthetic hydra thingies they, they have in there. They also have the ability to regenerate, go figure, right? So, in our example, we'll just, we'll just be talking about corpses for the moment. So, what if, what if... Somehow or other, whether it's through 5G or some other means, 
these corpses are just blasted, beamed with high frequencies. All the graphene within them and the... Uh, we're, I'm presuming in this case, and there's no way I can prove this, but it wouldn't surprise me if stem cells of one kind or another were put into the treatments, the stabinations, or in some way, through the carrier wave frequency, they're able to imbue, right, um, somehow the stem cells into these corpses and begin to engender tissue regeneration, neural regeneration, specific parts of the neurology. All the blood has been gone, so have they felt the need to replace the blood? Do they need to replace the blood, in our example? Will the undead, if it comes to that, need blood? And if they do need blood of some kind, well, what kind is it? Is there some kind of weird black goo inside of them? I, I don't know, right? Because as far as I know, the, the main purpose, one of the main purposes of blood is to transport highly oxygenated cells throughout the body, to the brain, etc., etc., right? The cardiovascular, cardiopulmonary system is why we need to breathe, right? And why the heart works the way it does to pump oxygenated blood throughout the body. Well, in our example, uh, these corpses, they don't need air anymore. They're dead. They've been dead for a while. So, what if anything, whether it's some kind of synthesized enzyme that can transmit into these people with a 5G or uh, synthesize some way uh, stem cells, the precise DNA pattern, who knows? We're talking intentions and capabilities, and we already know from the capabilities what we know thus far. Their capabilities are quite extensive. Nanoparticles, we're talking you know, nano-level stuff here, operating systems. So, let's just progress this thought um, a little further, right? So they find a way to start to engender tissue growth, not just in the brain, but throughout, throughout the body. And say they find a way to animate these uh, corpses, they're now zombies, right? The golem, the graphene golems. And we've talked about in the past the the spiritual component to the stabinations, the spiritual component to the treatments. I've had Bernard Gunther on the show again, and that show will be coming out pretty soon, where based on research in Germany, and he's German so he could read German, the findings, and my, my colleagues and I have independently come up with this um, idea and this uncovered this truth on our own. But in a nutshell, what the, the German researchers found out was that those who had received the, the treatments, the stabinations, not only did their health begin to decline, but there was a spiritual component as well. When these people that had been thus treated when they go to uh, energy workers, when they go to uh, very sensitive, psychically attuned uh, masseuses, massage therapists, etc., etc., sometimes the people working with these uh, individuals, uh, they get like a spiritual warfare attack. They, these entities seemingly come out of these people who've had the treatments and try to latch on to them. Right onto the masseuse, onto the um, the body worker, the energy worker, whatever the case may be. Right, so they found a clear pattern of this, and and Leone David was telling me about this too. Okay, long before all this monkey stuff, the monkey business was coming out. Long before the discussions about synthesized snake venom peptides was coming out, Leone was telling me, "I'm finding weird things in these people that have gotten the treatments." I'm finding weird reptilian snake things. I'm finding weird monkey things. And, and uh, she's just yanking them out, what she can yank out energetically. 
she didn't take the time to analyze what was going on with these people. Well, why is this in there? What's the what's this monkey business, right? Because she's on the clock, right? She's only got so much time to work with these people, so she's not too interested in the details. She she just wants to get these things out of them as much as possible. But she told me, and I remember this this distinctly that there is this weird component there's elements in these people monkey things there's there's elements of uh you know snake venom and reptilian stuff in there and, and like like i said she wasn't too keen on finding out what they were all about she just wanted to do her best to heal them and get these things out of them right so and also keeping in mind jerry marzinski's work sherry sweeney I've talked about this before, how there seems to be this uh, archontic spirit that is part and parcel of the ingredients of these treatments and how people feel disconnected to God after they've had treatments. They, they begin to hear voices, etc., etc. So all that must be factored in when we're talking about the graphene golems and if, when they, if they get reanimated, okay? So let's say that, oh, pfft. Only 30% of the corpses uh, are fully, effectively, 100% animated. Arms, legs intact, head intact, uh, and mobile enough to, to do whatever they're tasked to do in true golem fashion, okay? Say only 30% of them are fully formed that way. And the other 70%, <coughs> excuse me, they may, may be lis missing limbs or an arm or a leg, but, but so what, right? They can still crawl. They can still bite people, okay? The whole idea is to engender as much fear and all this other stuff and, and f quite possibly to use these graphene golems to hunt down the resistors. So when you factor in the archontic entity aspect to it as well, how the living, or the ones that are still living, that have had the treatments, they begin to be, be besieged by all these intrusive thoughts. That are, they go through abrupt personality changes. Uh, energy starts speaking out of them. All that stuff has already happened. People go nuts because of having received these treatments. So there's definitely a spiritual component to that, which the, the Germans have um, found out. And again, we're fortunate because Bernard can read German. So he's able to avail himself of all that information relative to the spiritual dynamic behind the treatments, okay? So let's carry that a little further. They've now reanimated uh, some of these corpses. These corpses are already imbued with this spiritual archontic intelligence. What if, what if, because of the non-operating systems within them, and depending on what parts of the brain were emphasized the neural tissue regrown, maybe enhanced in some way? Is it possible? And again, we're talking intentions and capabilities. Are they capable of doing these things? Well, right now, I'm just venturing into the realm of speculation, but I can imagine. Would they have the means to engender growth in certain parts of the brain or add on certain features to the brain to, say, provide a nighttime infrared vision capability. How about the enhancement of the ocular sense, the ability to smell, right? If they want these to be hunter killers, I would think that at some level they, they may want to do that, you know, give them infrared uh, capability at night or daytime, give them the ability to de detect scents and odors from quite a distance away. And of course, engender this ravenous, unquenchable hunger within them, right? Uh, because in the example of the pig brains being reanimated, you know, they, they began to require glucose and things like that in order to, you know, continue to function properly, right? Well, if the intent is to turn these people loose, so these graphene golems on the people against the resistors, against those who don't want to be rounded up, 
Well, where would they get their nourishment from? Besides the electro bioelectrical processes going on within them, besides the possibility of some kind of battery thing being installed within them to keep them going, well, they could sustain themselves in theory by by eating flesh, right? This also ties in to the eventual, it's possible, I hope it doesn't happen, well, I hope a lot of this doesn't happen, the eventual eradication of pets, of dogs and cats. They're already making an issue and have been about how cats are bad for the environment, cats threaten biosensitive environments, cats this, cats that. First they're talking about the feral cats, and then they're going to go after the uh, the owners of regular cats, household cats, because of some of them let their cats out at night and they harm the local flora and fauna. That's the angle they're using. And then they're going to start to have to, in their mind, have to uh, put restrictions and uh, on the, the, the cat owners. And eventually this will transfer over to dogs and dog owners and how they're bad for the environment too. Because we know in starvation times, right, Siege of Leningrad, it wasn't long before Dogs and cats start disappearing from the streets, and before too long, even rats were starting to be an endangered species, and eventually, uh, cannibalism took root in Leningrad. It was cut off for 999 days, right? Uh, they were able, at times in the winter, to get truck convoys in. But generally, the people starved for a long time, and uh, they had to resort to ghastly measures, including cannibalism. So, if you remove... Dogs and cats as a potential food source, and they're already going to all this trouble to prevent people from growing on their own, growing their own food, growing their own vegetables, etc., etc. Well, you have hungry, malnourished, sickened people trying to flee from swarms of drones as well as from zombies. Okay, graphene golems, and the graphene golems don't need to deal with dogs anymore, protective dogs, because eventually they may do their part do what they can to get rid of dogs and cats. So let's take our thought experiment a little further, shall we? What if, due to all the nano-operating systems, and whatever nanotech has embedded itself into the brain of these corpses that have been reanimated, all the graphene through them, and how uh, the tissue regeneration resulted in you know, new sinew, new muscles, new tendons, new tissue growth. What if they decide to give real-time instantaneous downlinked telemetry information about the battle space, right? So just as uh, robots and just as drones can be controlled individually or en masse, drone swarms operating on a pre-programmed or on a manual basis, a remote manual basis, what if, what if these zombies, besides having infrared capability, besides having an enhanced sense of smell, what if they can get a digital readout of, of the environment in front of them, right? And what if they have enough residual memory from the life they led before they became a graphene golem to know how doors operate, to know how windows operate, to think tactically or to be guided, okay? Some of the zombies, you try to bust in through the, the ground floor windows. Others try to get up onto the second floor, floor, get into the second story windows. What if this can be organized? What if this can be coordinated, right? The same way drone swarms are coordinated. Uh, drone swarms that are aerial and or uh, have mobility on the ground, right? And that have the means to uh, reassemble. Okay, a lot of these drones do and turn into larger uh, objects, such, such as bridges, for example. Well, what if the same capability, the potential for the same capability exists in these graphene golems, right? So, some psycho-hybrid nerd somewhere tweaking a joystick or a keyboard somewhere can direct these gra graphene golems towards certain targets, uh, very specifically maneuver them on a battlefield and give them real-time battle space information, right? 
And what if they have enough residual memory from having once lived that they have an idea of how to open doors, how to how to start cars, right? How how to how to wield axes and baseball bats or whatever the case may be, right? And you add on to that the entity aspect that the Germans have talked about, that Bernard Gunther talks about, that Jerry Marzinski talk, talks about, that I talk about. And the fact that these the ingredients of these treatments seem to have a supernatural spiritual component to them, okay? So the possibility exists that these graphene golems these zombies could have a, ma a malevolent, uh, demonic intelligence working through them. Ooh, I've got a medium through which to operate now. i got a body, right? Golem. And what if, because of the, the graphene, their sinews, their, their muscles, their tendons, their cartilage, or what passes for it, the equivalent thereof, what if it's much stronger than normal human tissue, right? Uh, we don't know what the potential, the capabilities of these beings are. I mean, uh, can they climb a, a wall like a Spider-Man or something and, you know, and, and run over <clears throat> jagged rocks and glass and not be affected and, you know, bounce off of speeding cars? I mean, it just makes me wonder why they would go to all that effort to put all those nano-operating systems, all that graphene into the treatments for people they, they know eventually are going to succumb unless these people, uh, you know, they go through some protocols to divest themselves of all the spikes and, you know, the synthesized snake peptide venoms and all that stuff, right? The prions and everything else. If they can find a way to, to detoxify from all that, Right? Otherwise, you know, the clock's ticking on a lot of these people that are still alive. And we haven't even talked about the potential of what happens when they crank up the 5G. Remember the ultra high frequency sonic waves, right? But in this case, I don't know if the 5G would be sonic, but at any rate, it would be a carrier wave of information. That's what the big appeal is. Oh, 5G, we can download so much more, so much faster. We'll download in the what, Right. Download movies or download information in the graphene golems, right? We don't know that yet. But what if, in our example, not only are people popping out of morgues and popping out of ambulances that, you know, had been, you know, proclaimed dead, right? Pronounced dead. Or start coming, clawing their way out of cemeteries. And if, if the governments and the corporations of the world begin using some excuse, oh, no, you know, you can't have a normal burial, monkey, monkey pox, monkey pox. We're going to, uh, you know, we'll send you flowers, but we're going to keep the bodies, right? Uh, containment, quarantine purposes, whatever the case may be. If the government starts doing that, collecting all these recently deceased bodies, or they start disappearing, or someone starts digging up all these graves, and all these grave robbers are out running amok, digging up freshly. And I'd, like also, I'd also like to know what the rate of decomposition is. How long does it take for these bodies to decompose if they got all this graphene in them? What's the rate of decomposition of the, the corpses of the people who died at the outset of all this compared to the ones who just recently died today or yesterday, right? Uh, how much of their cell, cell tissue is still intact, right? Did, did the graphene serve in some way like like an embalming fluid or, you know, did, did, it, did it pickle them in some way, right? We don't know. I'd like to know that. But getting back to the living, the ones that are still alive that have all this nano stuff, graphene running through them. Well, in our example, what happens when they crank up the 5G? I mean, then things begin to self-assemble. Things begin to, uh, you know, all these enzymatic reactions begin to, happen, occur in the body, catalyzing things, creating uh, all kinds of changes at a chemical molecular level, right? I mean, we just don't know. Will some of these people just, the moment they crank up all that, will they just turn it as zombies, graphene golems, right on the spot, right? 
So there may be different types of these graphene golems from those who were technically still alive but were turned or those who were recently deceased or had been deceased for a little while or had been de deceased for a while in all stages in between. And like I said, uh, even if only 20 or 30 percent of the corpses come out as a fully functional, intact zombie graphene golem, well, what about the others? Well, the others, the 70 percent of the rest, they may be, may be missing, missing an arm or a leg, but, but it doesn't matter because they can still crawl, they can still bite you, right? And there's probably going to be a lot of them. So I just wanted to put these thoughts out there because I just had to wonder what the purpose was behind all those Bluetooth signals being received, right? I mean, they're already dead. Are they going to go to that much trouble install all that nanotech into all these people, all that all that graphene, and they die, and then you just write that off, or they just write that off as overage, as wastage, right? Somehow, I don't get that feeling. I just don't get that feeling that they're through with those people, okay? And um, also, the fact that the, the carrier waves can imbue, whether it's medicine, whether it's chemicals, whether it's synthesized enzymes, whatever, they can also imbue the corpses, in our example, with DNA. But let's broaden our horizons. Well, what kind of DNA? Well, it could be reptilian DNA, it could be dogman DNA. We, we don't know, right? We don't know what they're going to put in there. We don't know what's already been put into the stabinations as far as DNA is concerned. We can only hazard a guess. I mean, this was this, this cornucopia cocktail of all kinds of things they put in these bloody stabs, right? I mean, they're shooting for all the marbles here. So anyhow, I just thought I'd get these ideas out. And again, I was prompted to do this podcast because I was just watching this video of these guys in the Israeli cemetery, ping, 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 ping. And they kept picking up all these signals, upwards of 30 dead people in that cemetery who were being picked up by Bluetooth because they were emitting, they were still emitting signals, right? And, and I would hazard to guess that each one of those serial number designators tells a story to somebody at some database center, some control center somewhere, telling them who they are, when they died, all this personal information, and also all this information about what exactly, what kind of operating systems they have within each one of these corpses, okay? And presumably, what the operating systems exactly, what types of operating systems exist within people that are still alive, right? So anyhow, I just thought that I'd run that by you. And um, thank you for listening once again uh, to our dear listeners out there. If you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member. And thank you once again for listening. Because this is a frequency war.